A permanent magnet is a metal in which the molecules are permanently aligned in such a way that they produce a magnetic field, which can exert a force on particles in other objects and also electrons. We give the two ends of a magnet the names North and South Pole, short for North Facing and South Facing Poles, because that's the way they would point to line up with the Earth's magnetic field, say, if we made them float. You can use iron filings or mini compasses placed around a magnet to visualise its magnetic field. Magnetic field lines are always complete loops, even though we don't draw them inside the magnet, and they never touch. These ones going out the ends here will eventually loop back round if we carried on drawing them. The direction of magnetic field lines is always from the North Pole to the South Pole of magnets. An induced magnet is a material, usually a metal, whose particles align temporarily when it's placed in a magnetic field, so it makes its own magnetic field. That's why an iron nail can be attracted to either the north or south pole of a permanent magnet when placed near it. So we say iron is magnetic, but it is not a magnet. Cobalt and nickel are also magnetic. Copper and aluminium, for example, are not. Bring two permanent magnets together and they will attract each other if their opposite poles are facing, and they repel if the same poles are facing each other. A solenoid is just a coil of wire that an electrical current can be passed through and it produces a magnetic field the shape of which is very similar to that of a bar magnet. You can increase the strength of the magnetic field made by increasing the current or adding more turns in the coil. A current flowing through even a straight piece of wire will produce its own magnetic field. We draw the field lines as concentric circles around it, using our right hand to remember which way the field goes. We use the letter B as a shorthand for a magnetic field, by the way, as well as in the equation coming up. The motor effect is when such a wire is in another magnetic field and it experiences a force. The equation is F bill, F equals BIL, where F is force, I is current in amps, L is length of the wire in the magnetic field, and B is the magnetic flux density, essentially the magnetic field strength. This is measured in Tesla. Note that this equation only works as it is if the current and magnetic field lines are perpendicular to each other. So that means that if the wire runs parallel to the field lines, it won't experience a force. However, to find out the direction of the force on the wire, we use Fleming's left-hand rule. Your thumb is force, first finger is field, middle finger is current. Make a gun shape with them where your middle finger is on the trigger, so they're all perpendicular, and bam, freeze, FBI. Just twist your wrist to line up your fingers with the current and the field, always north to south pole, and the direction your thumb is pointing is the direction of the force on the wire. In this case, it's upwards. To measure the size of this force in reality, we put the magnet on a balance. Due to Newton's third law, the magnet will also be pushed down with the same force. Calculate the force from the simulated mass measured, use an ammeter to get the current and a ruler to measure the length of the wire, and you can calculate the magnetic flux density between the poles of your magnet by rearranging the equation. Electric motors, of course, employ the motor effect by using a coil of wire that experiences opposite forces on both sides, causing it to turn. However, the current must be reversed every half a turn, otherwise it would just stop in the vertical position in this case, so that's why we have what we call a split ring commutator to reverse the current every half turn. To make a motor turn faster, you can increase the current, use a stronger magnet, or add more turns to the coil, so essentially there's more wire experiencing the force. A loudspeaker is, in essence, just a motor that goes back and forth instead of round and round. The varying current due to the signal from your phone, say, will cause the coil to vibrate back and forth, and that's attached to the speaker cone, which then produces sound waves in the air. So a magnet will cause a current carrying wire to move, but the opposite is also true. A wire that's moved through a magnetic field will result in a current being induced in it, if it's in a complete loop, of course. The electrons will move. To be more precise, we should say a potential is induced in it, essentially voltage. This is called the generator effect, sometimes known as the dynamo effect. A generator itself looks like a motor. You turn the coil and a potential will be induced in the coil. This is basically how power stations work. The steam made from burning fuels or nuclear fission turns the turbine, which turns this coil in the generator. A generator doesn't need a split ring commutator, it still works, all that it means is that it's an alternating PD that's induced, or alternating current AC is produced. If you do add a split ring commutator, it just gets rid of the alternating part of the current, so we've now got DC coming out of it instead. Lumpy DC, but DC nevertheless. Technically this is now a dynamo. To increase the output of a generator or a dynamo, just turn it faster, or similar to a motor, add more turns to the coil, or use a stronger magnet. 
I say turn it faster, but it's not that easy. You see, the current induced in the coil also produces its own magnetic field, and this opposes the turning that led to it being produced to begin with. So that's why it requires energy to keep it turning. And that makes sense, doesn't it? We can't get energy for free. Similar to a loudspeaker being a back and forth motor, a microphone is a back and forth generator. Sound waves move the diaphragm back and forth, which is attached to a coil that moves back and forth around a magnet, and then this induces a potential in the coil. That signal then travels through the wires to the phone, recorder, or whatever. Transformers are used in the national grid to change the voltage at which electricity is transmitted through the overhead cables. The current from a power station is so high that too much energy would be lost due to the resistance in the cables if it just went straight into them. Therefore, a step-up transformer increases the voltage before it enters the grid. This in turn reduces the current, so less energy is lost as heat due to resistance. The reason one goes up when the other one goes down is because electrical power is equal to voltage, or PD, times current, V times I. In an ideal world, the power in and out of a transformer should be the same. That would mean it's 100% efficient, so V and I would be inversely proportional. We can therefore say that V times I for the primary coil is equal to V times I for the secondary coil. This is the basic makeup of a transformer. The primary coil is connected to the power station, say in this case, and the secondary coil is connected to the overhead cables. There are more turns on the secondary coil here, which means that it's a step-up transformer. The voltage will increase, the current will decrease. More turns, higher voltage. The coils are wrapped around a soft iron core. Get this into your head right now though. There is, or should be, no electricity or current in the core. Instead, the electricity is wirelessly transmitted from one coil to the other, much like how an electric toothbrush is charged or wirelessly charging a phone. How is this? Well, it's because the alternating current in the primary coil produces a magnetic field, and the iron core acts like a guide for this. We use iron for the core, by the way, as it's easily magnetized and demagnetized. In other words, it's a good guide for the magnetic field. This magnetic field then induces a voltage and current in the secondary coil. In order for a current to be induced though, a wire must experience a change in a magnetic field, which is why we must use AC. If we use DC in the primary coil, it would make a magnetic field, but it would be static, it wouldn't be changing, and that can't induce a current in the secondary coil. The ratio of turns in the coils is equal to the ratio of the voltages. So if the secondary coil has double the turns, it has double the voltage and therefore half the current compared to the primary coil. So we can say NP over NS equals VP over VS. You can also flip the whole thing when it comes to rearranging to find VS or NS. A step down transformer at the other end of the cables steps the voltage back down to a safer PD of 230 volts, which means that it must have fewer turns on the secondary coil this time. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.